Now, she's a Ghanaian journalist and a politician, uh, a former Minister of State for Tertiary Education in Ghana. Um, she attended Maoli School and gained admission to the University of Ghana, where she graduated with a BA uh, degree in English. She also attended the University of Indiana, where she obtained a mass communication certificate. She was a press fellow from January to June 1983 at Wolfson College, University of Cambridge in the UK. Now, she was also the editor of daily programs at the African Service Division of BBC, the World Service. Apart from that, she's done so much. She was the editor of the Daily Graphic and Mirror newspapers, the first woman in Africa to edit a major national newspaper. I'm sure you know about that. Now, I don't know whether if I should say this, but it was on the first day of her work as editor of the Daily Graphic that some military generals were summary executed. Madame Elizabeth, unlike uh, any other editor before her, published a scathing criticism of the government's actions, an incident which finally saw her go into exile. Her advocacy for media freedom is legendary, and it is a real honor for me to ask her to join us on the podium. A round of applause for Madame Elizabeth O'Henry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Last night, after we lost the match, <laughs> I sat down to write my column for the Daily Graphic. Now, when I was first commissioned to write this column, I was told the column would be published on Wednesdays, and I should therefore submit my script by the end of the working day on Monday. Well, when I sat down last night, it was way past 10 p.m. because the match didn't enter then. And I had obviously missed my deadline. And I wondered what the editor would make of his columnist and what Elizabeth Ohini, as editor, would have had to say in such circumstances. Then I assured myself that oh, technology has changed newspaper, radio, television production so dramatically that you no longer need to send in features pages days before publication. So, and lots of things have changed since those days when I was a reporter and other things and editor and such on the graphic. Lots of things. Things have certainly changed since students from the University of Ghana led a march to the offices of the Graphic Corporation, as it then was called, and thrashed the editor's office and turned the newsroom upside down. Things certainly changed when that, I almost said mob, no, that crowd, sprayed graffiti with the legend, E. Ohini must die, on walls all around the city, because they were upset that I said the bloodletting must stop. Things had changed since an armed soldier came and held the entire newsroom hostage, demanding that I should be produced. And I was locked up in my office, and my staff stood sentry in front of the office to defend me. And things have certainly changed since some editors of state-owned newspapers would wait for editorials to be handed to them from the Ministry of Information. In the article that I wrote last night, I made reference to a theory that I, I evolved back in the 70s, whereby journalists in Ghana would often write strong condemnations about apartheid South Africa, 
Ian Smith and Rhodesia, Namibia, and they will strenuously avoid writing anything about what was happening in Ghana. In the 14 years that I spent with the BBC, it was not lost on me that the reason the BBC was so popular then in Ghana and in many parts of Africa was that it was the only station that provided a platform for alternative or opposition voices to be heard. In other words, if you wanted to hear what the opposition in your own country was saying, you tuned into the BBC. Today, nobody needs to tune into the BBC to hear what opposition voices want to say. The BBC, in fact, would not dare broadcast the type of language that is used to describe Ghanaian presidents these days, and which are broadcast loudly on local FM stations. I came back to Ghana in the year 2000, and the democratic infrastructure for press freedom was already largely in place. The battle had been fought and won, making state-owned media houses what they should be, giving them protection, the protection they needed, and obliging them to accept the right of re reply when needed. I acknowledge that I'm still talking in the past, and that those who were born in the year that I came back have now entered the university. In 2001, I was Minister for Media Relations. Yeah, that's what we called it, for reasons which we don't need to go into. And a certain Nana Dodanko Akufuado was Attorney General. And between us, we led the repeal of the criminal libel law. It was a manifesto pledge. And I remember that during my vetting in Parliament, I was asked repeatedly if I was sure we wouldn't live to regret the repeal of that law if we should indeed go through with it after we come into office. Those who were born after the event obviously do not know anything else but the existence in our country of free and multiple media outlets. And before long, it seems to me, even those old enough and who had lived through the old days have now forgotten how things used to be. As we now struggle to outdo each other in how rude and crude the media can be. Back in 2008, Someone, not a friend of mine, don't know why, aggregated the most outrageous and obscene of the things that had been written about me by four newspapers. I wondered if such stories, totally false, libelous, and deliberately calculated to malign and undermine a minister of state, and which had gone without any of the editors even being called upon to retract, apologize, or publish a rebuttal. I wondered whether it was the publication of such things that had helped to give Ghana the image of being a land of free press. I just wondered. I'm not the only person who's been abused and pilloried in the press. But at least for me, I'm in the public space. So I can say, and someone can say, that it comes with the territory. But what about the many instances 
where media outlets have been used to terrorize private citizens for private gain and or to settle personal scores. Such people have no access to legal redress. They don't have the money, they don't have the know-how, and they are not in the public space by choice, as I am. What about them? I'm not aware that anyone has made any tally of any such abuses. In the past 10 years, not only have our FM stations multiplied, we all have to admit that they have become creatures that most of us cannot recognize. Recklessness has become the dominant feature of our media, and it saddens me. Let me try and say a few words about the most recent event that's in the news. This is the conflict between the modern Ghana journalists and the state security, as we are told. Let me start by saying I do not like the idea of security agencies going to pick up journalists from their offices. I don't like it. It's crude. It's unnecessary. Let me, <laughs> let me also say that I was thoroughly alarmed to hear the editor of the news portal Modern Ghana say in a radio interview that he did not know who had written the piece that had led to his arrest by the national security. He said he did not know the writer, nor where the person was writing from. He had no contact address for him. OK. I could possibly live with that. I just could when pushed. But he added that he wasn't responsible for what the ghost writer had said in the piece. I'm sorry, he is responsible. You are responsible for what you choose to propagate. We, people seem to think that it is OK to put on your radio station, on your TV, in your newspaper, people saying the most outrageous things. And because you are not saying it, or sometimes I see you put a little thing, you claim a disclaimer at the end, does not reflect. I'm sorry, you are responsible. You cannot put out there things that you say you do not, it's because it's somebody's, you have not made any attempt to check whether it's correct or not, but you are just the microphone and you're putting it out there. I'm sorry, that is not how it is done. That is not journalism as I know it. Now, our host, TV3, for example, I so saw you broadcast something the, a few days ago. It was something that had been making the rounds on social media. So it's a list about some projects allegedly won by the David Ajay and Associates. It was a list of 11. And according to what you published, what I saw, you said the top first two had been confirmed. Now, what about the last nine? Rumor, unconfirmed, what? What's their status? Now, when you get into the state where you are repeating, you are putting something out without ascertaining its veracity, I'm sorry, you are putting yourself out there saying, demonstrating irresponsibility. I'm not holding any brief for uh, Ajay and Associates. It's a big company. I'm sure they're able to take care of themselves. But what about the little companies that are sometimes reduced to nothing? All their work is reduced to nothing because somebody 
publishes a totally false thing about them without bothering to check up. Now you see, we seem to all be alarmed because government agencies and security agencies are said to be in conflict with the media. It is my view that as for those ones, we can deal with them. What is truly alarming, what I find truly alarming, is the recent finding of the Afrobarometer on public sentiments on press freedom. And Mr. John Appinting wrote a, a very good and touching piece that I recommend to all of you. He, he called his piece, Are We Really Getting Tired of Press Freedom? According to him, the findings of this Afrobarometer show that media freedom supporters are now outnumbered by those who believe governments should have the right to prevent publications they consider harmful. Let me say that again slowly. <laughs> Says that media freedom supporters are now outnumbered by those who believe governments should have the right to prevent publications they consider harmful. Twen in 25, 25 out of 31 countries that have been tracked since 2011, support for an unfettered media has declined. And I quote him, more worryingly, the majority of Africans now see that the greater freedom enjoyed by the media today is a problem instead of an opportunity, unquote. In Ghana, according to this report, 57% of citizens want the government to control the media. Let me say that again. According to this Afrobarometer report, in Ghana, 57% of citizens want the government to control the media, 57%. That was more than President Akufuado got in his election. OK, let me say quite categorically that I do not belong in this 57% majority. And even if, God forbid, this majority should increase to 90%, I will still be a proud member of that minority that will believe that it is safer for us to have a free press and the government should not control the media. Technology has advanced and overtaken the media commission as currently constituted. That's my view. And in its current state, I suggest it is not fit for purpose. I'm not quite sure in my mind what we should do, but I know we ought to do something about it. Because we are not behaving the way we should. The National Communications Authority, NCA, recently tried to assert its authority. And they've closed down 48 stations since last year. Normally, I would, should be horrified. Then I started looking at the details. Why would stations, radio stations think that it's okay to operate outside the law? Why? You know, we say and we claim to be the fourth estate of the realm. It comes with responsibility. There is no such thing as a free press without a responsible press. I know 
I know. I would much rather we have verging on irresponsibility than all of you getting quiet and not doing and letting things be. But we have a responsibility to be responsible. Respect, like freedom, is not bestowed. It is end. And the media should earn it. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Another round of applause will do. Thank you. You can be